the lord bless you another time brothers and sisters so good to be in our homes again for another night of bible study and god be praised we have been having a great series a great time in looking in the word in studying assessing analyzing and for all of us i'm sure it's a great learning experience as we go through and as we dissect the word and look at the greek meanings the old greek words from which we, we derive a lot of these uh, words that convey the meaning to us and by so doing it gives us a sense a great sense of what exactly the apostle under the inspiration of the holy ghost was uh, trying to convey to the church we thank god that he has allowed us enabled us to drill down to be able to drill down and to look closely to look deeply into the word and it is my prayer that we will continue as a church to you know get into the word and i would like for us to look and to keep going back over these sessions because we we won't grasp it fully on the first go or even the second go it is something that we are going to have to over time go back over uh, we are doing our best the the slides that you're seeing you know we are going to compile them and so the first one in the series that we did before is just about ready with everything that we had done and that will be out shortly similarly for this bible study series um we will compile them and we will send them out also and it's very important brothers and sisters that we take our time and we go through and we learn from all the things that have been said review them and then put them into practice because that is the key that is the heart of uh, going into the word and walking in the word we can only walk based on what we know and uh, the last couple of weeks uh, has been a tremendous journey as we look at some things and this evening we are going to extract a few more things because wednesday after wednesday we learn a little bit more and we see a little bit here and a little bit there and the concept of putting line upon line and precept upon precept is very very important and we are doing that and god bless all of us who have been faithful over the weeks in fact i am now looking back and recognize that we have been having bible study in this format since about march or the latter part of march and uh, yes march and we are now in september and week after week after week you have all tuned in and we really appreciate that and as a church you know those that are from the local assembly uh, those that are a part of the family extended you're overseas or in other parts of the island we really appreciate the time and the faithfulness your faithfulness in tuning in to these wednesday evening bible studies and it is my prayer it is my hope that all of us will be tremendously blessed as a result of being a part of these studies as we know we have been going through on the series walking in the world when we met last i think we had <clears throat> looked at the fact that the roman 
fighting machine, the Roman army. They were the superpower in those days. And at the time when the Apostle Paul wrote uh, to the Ephesian church, uh, from which we were making reference in Ephesians 6 and verse 17 last week, to take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. We made much out of uh, that scripture. And um, it was very clear to us from the term that Paul used in relating to the sword uh, that the soldier used or the soldiers use in their, you know, clash with their enemies. Paul, out of about five different swords that the Roman army used over time, Paul singled out one particular sword. And that Greek word for the sword that Paul made reference to in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 is the Makara sword. Makara, sorry, M-A-C-H-A-I-R-A. -A -A. It's the Greek word that the Apostle Paul actually used. And that sword, that Makara, or Makara sword, uh, speaks to a sword with two edges. It is sharpened on both sides. That was the particular sword that the Roman soldiers used and caused the tremendous damage and inflicted serious casualty on the part of their enemies. It was this two-edged sword, it was this same word, this same sword that the Apostle Paul now used in Ephesians 6 and verse 17 so that we can understand what we have at our disposal. Of the five swords that the Roman army used over time, that last one, that Makara sword with the two edges sharpened was the one that was brutal as it related to the enemy. That's the one that was uh, frightful and was considered a, a, a machinery of murder and violence and brutality because of how significant it was in terms of the impact that it had on the enemies of Rome. What Paul was then saying or therefore saying is that we, by using the word of God, have at our disposal a weapon like that sword. And in fact, the Bible said that the sword of the Spirit is the weapon that we have to take on the adversary. And that sword of the Spirit is none other than the word of Almighty God. And brothers and sisters, it is simply saying to us that the Lord has equipped us. He has given to us what he knows is powerful, what he knows is an instrument of tremendous offensive impact. And he has given that to us so that we can use it in the warfare that you and I are in and use it to achieve and accomplish victorious things, mighty things, powerful things. And only if we use what he has given us will we be on the side of the victors. Um, there is no soldier, and we made note of this point last week. There, there are no armies that would dare to engage in battle. And those on the front line or those wherever they are in the lineup of the army go on the battlefield and don't have their swords. Or if we are looking in more modern terms, go on the battlefield and don't have their guns. And so we must understand that we have been given the weapons 
that are necessary for our victory, but it is very important that we understand and recognize our own responsibility to make sure that we are properly equipped and that we move with what we have and use it to the tearing down of the strongholds of the enemy. And so that is very, very important. I therefore would want us to look back as we move on now. I want us to look back at the scripture in Ephesians chapter number 6 and verse 17 because we are going to just tie up here and we are going to move on and we do have a thing or two just to share this evening uh, some of us might not even realize might not even have understood before now the significance of uh, what it is that we are going to read later on and the things that we are going to say but uh, light is sown or shown to the upright daily and we give God thanks for what we're gleaning from the word and so we will go in the word so Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 can we all look at the screen and at the scriptures and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God as I move into explaining I'm going to ask that we put up on screen at this time this a particular slide and I'm going to be going through a few slides this evening as I try to as I try to um, expound on the word so can we put this slide on the screen at this time we are up at about slide 16 because and we want to take our time and go through um, so that we can be together we can be clear and we can um, we can know exactly what it is and where it is that we want to push now we just looked at ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 and it is important we made the point just now that the word sword of the spirit sword is from the Greek word machara and we took time and we explained what that was and because Paul used the word machara to describe our sword of the spirit he was declaring that God has given the church a weapon that is just as brutal against our enemy and we cannot and must not overlook that very important thought right paul describes what it is that we have in our hands and by going back a little bit and looking at how vicious that particular piece of equipment is war equipment is then just linking it to our scenario our current present situation and realize that it represents the sword of the spirit which is the word of God then we know that we have something tremendously powerful tremendously brutal as it relates to our enemy and therefore we know that we are not on the battlefield yes we are not on the battlefield and do not have what it takes to tear down and to bring down our enemies and that is very important now the weapon which is the sword of the spirit which of course is the word of god 
has the potential to rip our foe to shreds. And that is something that we must always understand. Why is it that we say this? And I say this simply because when we understand how the soldiers utilized that sword, that particular Machara sword that drove fear into the hearts of the enemy, when we look back and understand how that sword was utilized and why it became such a fearful piece of equipment that the enemies shudder, not that they could not and did not attempt to make something of a similar quality, but then with the experience of the Romans over the years and over time and with this at their disposal, they went on for quite a while conquering, yes, and moving from country to country. And we have this ability and the potential to rip out and to push the sword through and to use like a dagger and to mess up and to tear up and to rip up the inside, the intestines of the enemy. Now, like I said last week, it sounds somewhat uh, gruesome and cruel, but we need to understand that, brothers and sisters, we are in warfare. And this is what warfare is all about. You and I are in warfare and we must never ever forget that. So when we hear about words like violent and cruel and gruesome and turning the sword in the enemy, it sounds a way. But in this, apply it to the spiritual warfare that you and I are in. And you are going to find out, we are going to realize and recognize, if we, if we have not yet already recognized, that the enemy hates us and he wants to cut our necks off and he wants to push his sword inside of us and to kill us. And all that he has been doing over time is to make sure that those that call upon the name of Jesus Christ die and this is the warfare that you and I are engaged in. And therefore, we must treat him in the same manner. He wants to tear up our intestines. We need to tear up his intestines. And we have been given what it takes to do that. Right? Um, I, I am sure I said it last week. But let me repeat just in case I may not have. That particular sword, the Machara, because it had two edges and the front of it, the tip of it, was bent upwards and that was also sharpened. When that soldier stabs into the enemy, he turns that sword and because both edges, because both edges were sharpened, he pushed it in and turned it. And as he turned, that sword grips the entrails of that enemy, grips into the intestines or intestine of the enemy. And the soldier turns it and then he pulls it out. And that is how vicious and dangerous that particular sword was that the Roman soldier used. It, no enemy soldier that came into contact with that sword when it is pushed in and turned could survive. Only two inches need to go in and touch into any of the organs of the body and the enemy is a dead man and worse when they push it and then turn it and then pulls you cannot survive it rips up the intestine it rips up 
the enemy. And what the Lord is saying, I have given you that weapon that will cause you to rip up the enemy when he comes into you like a flood. I, the Lord, have given to you, my people, that which I know that you can use in the battle, use in the warfare that you are in. And it can rip and it can tear and it can stab and it can cause damage, significant damage, collateral damage to the enemy. And that sword of the spirit is none other than the word of God. And we are going to take a little time to look at that root word that is called the word as is written in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17. And we are going to find that it is this word compounded with some other things. And together, that word is powerful, is quick, it is even sharper than the Macaria sword of the Roman soldier's fame. And it will pierce and it will stab and it will cut and it will do things to the enemy that will ensure the victory for you and I. That sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The very word that many of us have put aside, the very word that many of us has taken for granted, the very word that many of us just can't bother to read, it is the very thing that will give us the victory as an offensive weapon over the enemy. And so as we go on, we are going to see that there is absolutely no way that we can be victorious without the word of Almighty God. And I speak that in all truth and make nobody tell you. And I will ensure that nobody try to convince me that we can make it in our Christian walk without having, dwelling, abiding, walking in the words of Almighty God. And that is very, very important. So as we look back at that, um, at the screen and look back at the slide, we are going to, right, we are going to recognize that the term word is taken from the Greek. Oh, sorry. The word, the word, the term word is taken from the Greek. That Greek word, R H E M A, Rima, is taken from the Greek word rima. And it describes something that is spoken clearly, vividly, unmistakably. It is spoken in a certain and definite term. So when we talk about the rima word, yes indeed we are talking about the book itself but we are also talking about uh, the, the word from the Bible that is quickened, that is Holy Ghost inspired, and that inspiration that comes from heaven, that anointing that comes from heaven, joined together with this written word produces what we call the Rima word. And that is very, very important. Many folks don't understand, don't recognize how important this Rima word is. 
very, 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 very important. And so the Rima words are very powerful. When the, the Holy Ghost supernaturally quickens such a word or Bible verse to a believer's heart and mind, that believer knows that he knows that he has heard from the Lord. There is absolutely no doubt in his mind. Jesus referred to this quickening work of the Holy Ghost in St. John chapter 14 and verse, tw verse 26, when he said, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. And so this is essentially how it works. The Holy Ghost may drop a rima word into our hearts, supernaturally remind us of a scripture, or put us in remembrance of a particular Bible promise. When this happened, the word, the scripture, the promise, all from the word, floods our entire being uh, with faith because the Spirit of God has spoken to us in a way that is very clear and unmistakable and undeniable and unquestionable and it is certain and it is definite and this happens in the experience of many Christians. God pulls from the reservoir of that which is within us and pulls that word and then he quickens through the Holy Ghost that word and allow that to minister to us and to take us through a particular situation. And many, many saints of God can identify with this happening. What is sad, however, is that if we first don't have the word resting in our bosom, resting deep on the inside of our being, if we don't first have the word in our minds in our, and in our hearts, then there is not going to be anything that the Holy Ghost will have to bring back to our memory and bring back to our hearts and that he will use to bring us or take us through a particular, particular situation. And so it is very important, brothers and sisters, that we have the written word marinating our minds, marinating our hearts, constantly being fed into our system, constantly being digested, being meditated on over and over and over again. Because what is going to happen when the enemy start to come in and start to bombard the mind and start to push to inject things into our lives, into our minds, into our system, to cause us to go a particular way or to think a particular way or to become discouraged, we are going to find that once we have word inside of us, Sometimes we might search for a word and we can't even pull one at the moment to address and to deal with a particular situation. But the Holy Ghost quickens our anoints and pulls from deep within. Just as we said earlier from uh, the book of St. John. What is going to happen? St. John 14 and verse 26. What is going to happen? But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. This concept, this principle works with 
every single believer that have the spirit of Almighty God. And we are going to be in situations, we are going to be under the weather sometimes, we are going to be attacked by the enemy, but the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost is going to pull from within us that which is already there and he will pull a word for a particular season, for a particular situation. But, brothers and sisters, that word must first be there. And that is the point of the principle of the Rima word. The word must be there. The written word must constantly be fed into our system so that it has a place. And some of us, uh, we, we don't re remember things uh, as in the past. And that is normal and natural with our progression as human beings. As time goes on, we won't always remember. And so we are not here just talking about remembering and committing to memory. Yeah, that is one and that is important. But what happens as we start to age? The faculty that causes us to remember is not as strong, not as powerful. So does it mean that as we grow old, we are unable to withstand the enemy? No. What it means is that even if our memory that we depend on and rely on a lot of time to bring back a particular verse, to deal with a particular situation, even if we physically are incapable of having the thing coming back to mind, once we have the word and we are walking in the spirit, that Holy Ghost is going to, from time to time, take from what is inside of us. And he, the comforter, he, the Holy Ghost, is going to bring back to our remembrance, to our memory, words that were already there. And he has a way to do it so that we can deal with situations and circumstances that we all will find ourselves in from time to time. And these, and remember, you know, I said this, the situations, the circumstances that come our way over time represents our battlefields. All of us have battlefields at work or school or home or wherever it is that we spend the time, wherever it is that we focus our attention over time can easily become a battlefield because the adversary is going to be on the prowl looking where he can get the upper hand of you. So believe it or not, your job might be your battleground. Believe it or not, brothers and sisters, your, your home might be the battlefield. But wherever it is, the important, crucial, critical element is that we have the word dwelling richly inside of us. We continue to read the word. We continue to pour in the word day by day and with each passing moment, week by week, year by year. There has to be the consistent, dedicated, diligent approach to reading and studying and meditating on the word. Our lives and our victory depends on that. And so... It is important that we understand and we are clear on that concept. It is when we have the word, when it is dwelling richly inside of us, that we can use that word and stab the adversary. Yes, stab, not just to swipe at him and to cut him. It, it, it is not the swiping action of a sword that kills no, on the contrary, it is the stabbing action of a sword that mortally wounds the enemy. Yes, yeah, so it's not to swing left and swing right. and it, No, it is to, in the warfare, move and move and be strategic and be clear that we are getting as close as we can because we are going to use that sword and we are not going to just swipe to cut. We are going to push to stab. And that is what brings death 
to the enemy. Yes, and I want us to understand that. So the word is very, very crucial. The word is very, very, very important. Now, having said that, I am going to back that up with an experience from Scripture. But before I back it up, I want to go a little bit further and examine what is a two-edged sword. Right? So the slide is asking the question, what is a two-edged sword? And we need to understand the term. And we need to understand what is at play here so that we can be clear as to how this thing work we're going deeper brothers and sisters we are going further saints of the most high god because i want us to understand sometimes we preach it and there's a difference between preaching you know and teaching and you know sometimes when you spend 15 minutes 20 minutes you know half an hour whatever the time is uh three quarter hour preaching because it's preaching time and it's sunday morning i will pick out a little part here and the part that you know is for me we pick it out and we forget the other part sometimes we move over some things that we really ought not to move over and we we miss some critical elements that are crucial to our advancing in god and we are going to take time and go through because i want us to be very very clear now, the scripture in Ephesians 6 and verse 7, 17, and we have dwelt on it for a while because it was the base scripture that we had used and we had looked on as it relates sorry, to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Yes, and... What, <clears throat> what is very, very important is the fact that we kept talking about this Machara sword, which is sharpened on both sides. It has two edges. It is sharp. And that concept of two edges is a concept that, and, uh, that, that, that is not new in particularly new testament scriptures right we look in revelation revelation chapter 1 and verse 16 and we look also over in revelation chapter 2 and verse 12 revelation 1 and verse 16 and it says and he had in his right hand seven stars and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength so out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword right so we see it in scripture and revelation 2 revelation 2 says something um very very similar verse 12 and the angel of the church in Pergamos, and the two, the angel of the church in Pergamos, write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. So we are seeing that the use of this term, the sword with two edges and it is something that is there that has been used over and over in fact in fact um, hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12 speaks to that also and this is very important hebrews chapter and i'm just taking the time out to read them because i want us to know that what i'm speaking about and what i'm going to um, 
submit to you is a, is a principle that is there. And the fact that these scriptures are here talking about the sword with two edges, it is something that permeates New Testament scriptures in relation to the word. So here Paul was at this point writing to the Hebrews and he's saying to them in chapter 4 and verse 12, for the word of God, here again we are talking about the word, and the, the, the term, the Greek word, yes, is, is, is the same, rima. But notice now, it says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, any two-edged makara. That same word is used there. That's the sword that is sharpened on both sides. But here the word is being applied to the saints, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart so that this sword is now being described and it applies to the saints so that the identical phrase that we made reference to in those other scriptures in Revelation, in Ephesians 6, 17, the, uh, is that identical phrase is here being repeated in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. Yes, and it's the sword of the spirit that, it is, that is being spoken of. The word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Why is the word of God repeatedly referred to as a two-edged sword? Why is the word of God repeatedly referred to as a two-edged sword? Why? I want us to go back and look at the slide and let us go through something that is very, very, very important. The phrase two-edged is from the Greek word dia it is important that we take a little bit of time and understand what this word means. In fact, it should be that word should be actually the Greek word is actually D I S. D-I-S-T-O-M-O-S. -S. So it is incorrectly spelled there. My apologies. But that Greek word, the phrase two-edged, is from the Greek word. It should be D-I-S-T-O-M-O-S. -S. It's pronounced diastomos. Right? Good. So make that correction. And we'll have it corrected later on on the slide for you. And it is a compound of the word die, which means two, and the word stomos, which is the Greek word for mouth, brothers and sisters. So that when the word and the spelling is the same, that I just gave to us, D-I-S-T-O-M-O-S. -S. That is the spelling of the word. All right, very important. So, it is a compound of the word die, which means to, and the word stomos, which is the Greek word for mouth. Thus, when the word that stomos 
are put together, are compounded, it describes something that is two-mouthed. And I want us to take time and grasp that. So, in scripture, it is said there, and it is translated as two-edged, which is fine, because we speak about the sword, and the sword has the two edges, and both edges are sharpened. So, it is the two edges are sharpened, fine. But as we go and dig into the root words, we realize that the root words gives us a meaning, not different, but it, 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 it expresses it in a different way. And it speaks to to die, but stomos is the Greek word for mouth. So it is literally saying the two-mouthed sword. So if we go over to Revelations 2, which we looked at a while ago, and verse 12, it could easily be translated a sharp sword with two mouths. And the very identical phrase is found in Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse 12. Yes, the writer... <coughs> Of Hebrews said, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged distomus. And that is very significant. Why is the word of God repeatedly referred? Because it's the same thing in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 16. So here it is. Here it is in Revelation 1 16. Distomus. Revelation 2 verse 12, distomos. Rev Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, distomos. The sword with two mouths, the two-mouthed sword, the two-edged sword. Why? Why is it? Why is it so called? And we are going to take a little time and look at that. Or why is it that the original Greek text actually say that the word of God is a two-mouthed sword. And it, it's kind of, you know, hard to reconcile and to put together. But it is important that we keep in mind, saints of the Most High God, that the Romans had previously used a large sword that was sharpened only on one side. Yes, we spoke about the different swords that they used, the Roman soldiers used, and there were five of them, and all of them, save one, were sharpened on only one side. The other side of the blade was dull and blunt, and that sword was called the, the gladius, and you had others and so forth, but it was not on both sides as we see with this particular Machara sword. The Machara sword, which is what the Apostle Paul used in describing the Word of God, the two-edged sword, or the, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, that sword was sharpened on both sides of its dangerous blade. And because the blade of this special sword was sharpened on both sides, it made deeper gashes and wounds that the other swords could not do. It was also terribly sharp and pointed at the tip. I mentioned that earlier on. Hence, if the soldiers push that blade into the enemy and wrench it or turn it inside that opponent's stomach, it would pull out that the man's entrails from his body and what a terrible death he would experience. When the soldier used this deadly two-edged sword correctly, it always left, listen to me, it always leave the enemy soldier in a pool of blood because of how dangerous, how vicious, how how much it has, this Machara sword, the ability to turn and to pull out the entrails of the enemy. He always is left lying in a pool.
pool of blood. And I want us to not forget that. However, this can only happen if and when the soldier use the two-edged sword properly. It is crucial that we understand that concept. Very important. What do we now mean <clears throat> by the two-mouthed sword? Let me explain something to you. And it is important that we literally grasp this concept. Very, very, very important. The two-mouthed sword, as opposed to the single-blade sword. But the two-mouthed sword, the two-edged sword. Why did the scripture in Revelation 1.16, Revelation 2.12, Hebrews 4.12. Why is the scripture talking about the two-mouthed sword? The Bible, which is the word of God, which we know is the sword that we use, has one blade, very sharp, because this word that is written here came straight from the mouth of of God. Follow me closely. The sword is sharpened one side because it comes straight from the mouth of Almighty God. So one side, one mouth, bam, straight from God. The other side, which is the other mouth, comes from the user who is going to use the sword. You and I, by virtue of our confessing, using, verbalizing the word, sharpens the other edge. So that the word of God is sharp on both sides because it comes from the mouth of God and the mouth of man. Everything that is in this book comes from the mouth of God and it is very sharp. When we decide that we are going to use this word properly, a crucial element of using the word is when we start to verbalize and speak the very thing that are things that are written in the word. So that we using the word and speaking the word and God allows the Holy Ghost to quicken us and bring to our memory from this word which is already sharpened. And we now have that word inside of us and speak the word. That's the other mouth being added to the sword. The other side being sharpened. So that the two mouths is the mouth of God and the mouth of man. You and I have a role to play when we are using the word. To not only read, because reading the word is one thing. We have it inside. How does it become active when we walk in it, when we live it, when we speak it? And when we speak it, we, we are lending our mouths to this word. That is the second mouth. That, the first mouth, the mouth of God. The second mouth, the mouth of man. The Two-mouthed sword, God and man together, using this word. Always decimate, tear to pieces, pull apart every stronghold of the enemy. Make no mistake about that. And it is as simple, as simple as that. 
It is as profound as that. The two-mounted sword, God speaking and then man speaking the word. You don't think that that happens? You don't think that a principle was shown to us where men speak the word in their warfare with Satan? I want us to turn and I'm going to ask if we could just find one scripture and I will continue to speak as we look at the scripture. But let us turn to St. Matthew. St. Matthew chapter 4. Because I want us to see this concept being made, literally made alive in the life of the founder of Christianity. And we are going to see him applying the word in his warfare with the adversary. And you are going to see something coming out of that experience. And I say this to say that many of us <clears throat> realize that as we walk, as we journey in this warfare, we make it or we don't make it based on a number of things. But can you and I associate ourselves with situations where questions come to our minds as we go through this journey we have, might have been in this thing for years we might have been walking with God for a decade or more we know certain things and yet at this point in 2020 with all that is happening can you associate in any way with certain things being placed in your minds right now, questioning the literal authority of Almighty God and His rulership in your life? Can you associate with the adversary using a particular situation right now in your life, in your experience, to cause you to doubt God? Brothers and sisters, let me be very open and very frank and be very real with you. The things that Satan is going to use to try to tear you down and bring you apart and take you away from the tract that you and I are on are not going to be big, heavy stuff. That you can say, you know, this is something heavy and let me try and struggle with it because it is heavy and if I get this going and can push this off, I will make it. No, he's not going to use those strategies. I want us to understand, and I said it before, we have only been on this scene of life, some of us 50 odd years, some 60, 70, 80, some just 20, some years, just teenagers. So we just come. Satan is a spirit. And he has been around from Job day. He was the accuser of Job. He has been around from Adam's day. For he was the one that went to Eve and put the thought into her mind and caused the reasoning to take place and for sin to come into the world. He has been around for millennia. He is no stupid novice. Although sometimes we speak things to belittle him, which is a strategy that we use, fine. But even if we use those strategies, we need to be clear in our minds that he's not a novice. This is the same Lucifer who was son of the morning. He knows the ins and the outs of spiritual warfare. After all, he has been involved in this from the very beginning from before humankind was placed on the earth, he was involved in strategizing against God. So it is not a novice that we are contending with. And he knows humankind. He dealt with Eve at the beginning, and she succumbed. He dealt with Adam, and ultimately he succumbed. He dealt with mankind throughout history and they succumbed. So that we need to understand 
who we are up against. And so he is going to come to us. He is going to come to you with trickery, in guile. We need to understand his wiles, his strategies, his areas of deception. And then he attempts to pull us down in subtle but powerful ways. And that we must never lose sight of. That we must be clear cut that he is going to come in subtle ways. So you will be at home or you will be at work and all of a sudden after 20 years of serving God, after 30, 40 years of being married. After years of raising your children and doing everything and are putting things in a particular way on the job or in your business. Something goes wrong with the business. It collapses. Because that can happen to anybody. And guess what is going to come to your mind? After serving God all these years, I gave myself to the church. I gave myself to ministry. And look at what happened. And then all of a sudden you're going to hear a voice in the back of your head. Something reasoning deep on the inside. And many times you don't share it with nobody, you know. But I am going to tell you this as a saint of God that are battling in your mind and wondering if God is working for you or if you have already lost the battle. Listen, it don't matter how many years you have served God. And if you are in your 30th or your 40th year in terms of serving God, you still will be faced with questions in your minds, things being put there in your heart, in, in, in your whole psychic how am i here by this god supposed to have allowed me to be going through sailing on top of the sea simply because i have paid my dues and i've gone through many things before and now should be the golden moment but can i tell you in this life in the warfare that you and i are in until the last breath. Because if we dare ease up and say it is easy street now, others will run past us. We are going to miss the mark. Until our last breath, we need to be pushing and at the same time we need to anticipate and expect that the adversary is going to be at us. Yes, he is going to pull back every now and then because he can't keep fighting. And when we use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and we plunge it into him, he's going to have to pull back. And it happened in the experience with Jesus where he left him for a season. And he's going to leave us many times for seasons. But him coming back, and I want every saint to know that. And so in your experience with your husband and with your wife, in your experience with your children, in your experience at the workplace, because this is where he is going to push the battle, where you spend your time. And if you think warfare is not going to come in at your house, you make a sad mistake. If you think warfare not when come in amongst the children or between husband and wife, you make a sad mistake. He is going to attempt to cause distortion of facts. He is going to use others who are weak to send a word that is a lie or whatever. A word that is going to be misunderstood and it is going to cause friction. And problems in your business place, at your jobs, and at your homes, and even in the four corners, in the walls of the church. 
and we need to be aware of that. And this is how he does it. But the, the, I, I say all this to make this particular point that even if somebody comes and tell us something, even if a physical altercation took place at the office and things went out of place for a period of time, when you retreat and you get back home, all these things are going to be playing into our minds. And it is as they begin to be played out in our minds that we are going to hear questions coming. And if you take time out, saints of God, and be very keen and careful and, and, and open and be real and be honest, we are going to find that in many of our minds, all of us have had that experience. The thoughts are there. I wonder if I should continue. I wonder if this thing is really real. After 20, 30 years of salvation, I wonder where the thoughts like these come from when you have given your years to the Lord and he has been good. Yes, there were ups and downs. But to ask a question, I wonder if this thing is real. I wonder if God is really there. I wonder if God is still for me. Because why do these thoughts come? Brothers and sisters, they come because this is the mode of operation of the adversary, the devil. And he is going to come flooding the mind. And I say this to come to the two-edged sword part now. Because to have the word inside is one thing. To have the word inside and walk in it and speak it is another. So that if we are going to counter the adversary with the things that he is going to inject in our minds, it is not enough just to try to switch from thinking one thing to another. Because many times it is not that easy. Young men can tell you that a certain thought process is in the mind and coming to church and hearing, for example, the preacher say, don't think on the, those things. Just don't think it. Many times it is easier said than done, especially if you're a young man and certain sensual things start to invade the mind and so forth. It's not as easy to do as we just say. However, there is a big difference if we accept and if we decide that we are going to proceed in a particular manner and then we speak with the other mouth, the word, and speak it from our being, but it has first got to be there. And so when the word dwells in us richly, and God's word, this word which is God's word, is here. God already spoke it, so his mouth is already on it. Because it is here. We now have it inside of us. And we speak it out. And speak it to our situation. And speak the word into our minds. It is important that we understand how potent that action of speaking the word is it is powerful sins of the most high God. This is the concept of the two moated sword. God speaking, God's mouth, man speaking, man's mouth. Man is not God. And therefore God speaking his word is the all encompassing word. Full stop. Man now speaking what God has placed inside of him is to counteract every push and every word that the adversary is going to speak into your mind and into your heart. When a thought comes into your mind that you must eat your brother, that did not come from God. And many times it, didn't, it don't even come from us, although sometimes it comes from us. 
But many times it is injected into our thoughts because of some things that our brother or our sister might have done to us. And it is injected there to hate them. But if we know the word and the word is dwelling inside of us richly, we can speak to our minds, speak through our mouth that we must not eat our brother and our sisters. And he that eat it is a murderer and declare the word so that it counteracts the influence and the effect of what is being pushed into our minds and into our hearts. So let us look at the scripture at St. Matthew chapter number 4. So turn to it brothers and sisters and we are going through this together. Then was Jesus led up of the spirit into the wilderness. To be tempted of the devil. And um, when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, notice. The tempter came to him. He said, this is the tempter speaking. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. So Jesus was in the wilderness, <clears throat> going through, just wrapping up his time of fasting and prayer. He was there for 40 days and 40 nights and he was going through and the testing of the devil was extreme and intense, brothers and sisters. And notice that the devil said, that means the devil was speaking. No doubt it was in the same way that the devil speak to you and I in our minds. Mark, you know, he could have spoken to him audibly there, not saying yeah or nay. The point I want to make is the adversary has a way of communicating to us. And you look at the things that flow through your minds at work in relation to somebody else, at home, in relation to your husband, your wife. At home, in relation to your children or to your parents. And the business, in relation to your... You just look. And many of us can identify with and realize that the adversary has injected himself into our consciousness and caused us to think particular ways. And here is what... The adversary said to Jesus, if thou be the son of God. Now Satan knows that this was the son of God. Because we need to understand as we go through scriptures, you know, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. We are going to see sometime as Jesus come on the scene. Some men that are filled with demons fall to the ground and say, we know who thou art. Torment us not. So that the Satan knows who Jesus is. He knows that it was the Son of God. He knew, sorry, that it was the Son of God. But notice what he said. If thou be the Son of God. In other words, he's trying to tell him, say, prove you are the Son of God. Prove yourself then. Show that you are the Son of God. That's, that's trickery. That's him using his wit to try to pull Jesus in a particular way to do a particular thing. Brothers and sisters, that is exactly how he is going to come and he has been coming to us. And many of us have failed because when certain thoughts come into our minds about a brother or about a sister, about our 
mother or about our father or about our son or our daughter. We just jump and believe it. And then we start to take actions immediately based on the things that have been injected into our minds. Not realizing that this is how the adversary works. It is not that he's going to turn up like a phantom or ghost in the house. These are the channels that he works through. And this is how it happens most of the time. The person who end up backsliding didn't just backslide in a day. It was thought out properly. The person who went and to the doctor and said, Doctor, I don't want to proceed with this baby anymore. Give me a tablet. It was well thought out. This is how the adversary work. And we always end up being punched over, being thrust through because we misunderstand, we misjudge how terrible and how much the adversary is pushing to get us to think the, think the wrong way and so to leave with a particular position in relation to God or in relation to our brother or our sister. And I want us to understand this and to apply the word. And look how Jesus dealt with these issues every single time that they came and it is very very significant jesus faced the enemy in the same way that we face the enemy in life understand that brothers and sisters in this portion of scripture the devil was saying to jesus if you are who you say you are show me How did Jesus answer Satan? And now we come to verse 4. And this is very significant. But he answered and said, It is written. Oh, hallelujah. It is written. I want us to understand this saints of the Most High God. The Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, in all of his power and might provided a verse to Jesus right in season. This is a Rima word, you know, because this word was already in him. And I want us to, un he drew a scripture right up out of Jesus' spirit. Who then spoke it forth. With great power and authority, brothers and sisters, sometimes we have to speak the word. It must be dwelling in us and we must be some things we walk in and at other times we speak the word to the very thing that is bombarding our minds, to the very questions that Satan is throwing at us. We need to speak the word, but the word must first be dwelling inside of us richly. And Jesus wielded that Rima word like a mighty blade and said, it is written. And the enemy could not stand against it. Why was the Holy Ghost able to pull a sword up and out of Jesus' inner man? Because the Lord Jesus had spent time studying meditating and praying over the word of God. As a child, you know, he had been reared in the synagogue and he had heard the word of God week after week after week of him going into the synagogue. He had the word of God dwelling inside of him. And over a period of time, Jesus in his humanity had taken the word of God deep into his soul. Thus when Jesus needed a word needed to use the sword of the spirit he was able to reach 
deep into the reservoir of the scriptures that was stored up inside and quickened those verses to his mind and he spoke them out of his mouth and by doing that it became a two-edged two-mouthed because listen the word that jesus spoke you know wasn't just it was a word that was already most folks don't even know when jesus said it is written and he started to quote most folks don't know that that, ver that first quotation of Jesus was from Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. It was a verse that was already committed to his heart. It was in his system already because he went to the synagogue over and over and over. Every week he was there and he was in the word and it was in his system. So when the moment came and Satan whether by in his ear or into his mind. Say, look here, if thou be the son of God. Jesus was able to come with a word from his innermost being. And say, it is written. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3. And it was reeled off in the ears of the adversary he needed that particular two-edged sword word to repel the adversary's attack for that moment and i want us to understand that i want us to be clear on that i want us to not lose sight of that and it's not done there Notice what happened next in verse 6. The devil attempted to kind of pull a mind game on Jesus just as the enemy tries to pull mind games on you and I. The devil said, if you are, if thou be the son of God, cast thyself down for it is written. Mm -hmm. For it is written. And again, Satan used scriptures brothers and sisters sometimes even the scriptures the adversary satan is going to use at you you don't hear god say that the saints of god are blessed blessed shall be thy cupboard blessed shall thou be in the field blessed shall thou be when you go out blessed shall thou be when you go in come in but look what is happening to you you feel dry up. You cupboard empty. You go out and this happened to you. You come in and this turn over in your house. You don't say God not with you and you're not blessed. He's using the word but he's turning it against you. Because he wants you to doubt the word of God. This is what he does. And he is doing the same thing here again. If thou be the son of God cast thyself down. Because it is written, he will give his angel charge over the... To, and he goes on and he goes on. Keep in mind that Jesus had just stopped the enemy with the word of God. From the first temptation. De Jesus had just said to him, you know, it is written. How did the devil react to the stabbing action of the word of God? He threw the word of God right back. To Jesus. Yes. Saying again. It is written. He uses the word at us. Saints of God. He sees when you are going through. A, a weak moment. And he used a word. And threw it at you. To show you why you are no longer a child of God. Because the Bible says you mustn't do this. And look what you are doing. And let me tell you. Those of us who do a things in darkness and in secret and think nobody knows we always hear say if nobody knows god know but it's not only god know i want you to know that that adversary or is he knows too because the word is going to go back to him and him going know those that are serious 
he knows those that are not. He knows those that are genuine. He knows those that are great pretenders. And he has a way to give the pretenders rope because he knows that it is just a matter of time that you are going to hang yourself. Be certain. And he knows the scripture. So sometimes the reason why Satan allows some folks that he sees dabbling over and over in sin, the reason why he allows you and oppress you no more, he is giving you rope because he knows the word. Be sure your sin is going to find you out. It's just a matter of time. And he knows it, so he draws back and gives you rope to hang yourself. He knows the word and he's going to use it against you. And this is what was happening to Jesus every time. And for every temptation, for every temptation that came the way of Jesus, three times the adversary came. And every time that he came, Jesus responded, it is is written it is written in said matthew chapter 4 and verse 7 now jesus told the devil again jesus said unto him it is written again thou shalt not tempt the lord thy god how did jesus know to quote that scripture and brothers and sisters, this now is another scripture in Deuteronomy 6 and verse 16. This is a scripture coming way back from the book of Deuteronomy, Old Testament. Jesus was here now, Matthew writing about this New Testament time, New Dispensation period. Devil attacking Jesus and Jesus is now quoting to him, from a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 16. Clearly, this word was inside of Jesus. Clearly, he had committed it to his heart and he knew the word of God well. It was already stored up inside of Jesus and the Spirit of God could easily draw it out of him like a deadly blade. But notice he spoke it out of his mouth. The principle of the two-edged sword. Brothers and sisters, I would want to encourage us. I would want to admonish us. I would want to teach us. Look at all the situations and listen to what I'm going to suggest here. Look at the situations that confront us from time to time. Look at the situation that confront us over and over and over again. What is it that keep coming to mind it, that keeps coming to our minds that is somehow pulling us down? What is it that continually comes to us? What is it that the devil is pushing at us and, and trying to entrap us with. Let me tell you some of the things that constantly come to us and therefore some of the things that we need to do. And I'm just going to say this essentially to give us a simple strategy. Simple strategy. We will find that he comes and he tempts us and he tells us that you are a loser. Don't you see how many times you have done the same thing over and over? You are a loser. Don't you see God is not interested in you because no matter how you say, God, please forgive me. And he forgives you. Don't you see that you do the same thing again? And again? You are a loser. You are a victim. 
and he is going to put that young person, young people, he is going to put that in your mind and tell you that you can't make it because you are not the person that you present yourself to be and that you present yourself to be because you're always doing this thing over and over and you will never get the victory over this because you're just not a victor. When thoughts like these come, I am submitting to all our young people, to all the saints of God. And if you hear me talk, sing out the young people sometimes, saying, don't feel any way. It's just that the young persons are on my heart and they are our future and they are the next set of leaders and a lot is going to hinge upon them later on and I want them to know that you are not losers. I want for every situation, everything that comes to mind, negative about yourself, that the adversary inject into your mind. I want us to jot them down. When he says you're a loser, I want us to go through so, and in fact, I'm going to do it and share it when we get here again. I want us to look at a corresponding scripture that must be in your system and that we can at least have for the time being that we are going to practice to speak in faith and release the power that is inside of us as we speak these scriptures. So if the thought come that and, and, and they've injected into the mind that you are a loser and you are a victim and you will never be an overcomer. I want you to find a scripture right in this book that says you are more than a conqueror. That you are an overcomer and you are a more than conqueror through him that love you. The scriptures are there. If it says that you are going to hell because you have been constantly doing the things over and over and that you are guilty, I want us to find the scriptures that show that Jesus took care of that question of guilt long ago and that you can overcome and have the upper hand of that guilt. We fail to recognize that for every weakness that is on the face of this earth and that the adversary take and inject into your mind that you are weak because this has happened to you and you have fallen down a hundred times already and there is no more we need to find the scriptures and have them close to us that we can speak when these things come into our minds and speak against it in the same way that Jesus spoke against every accusation or sorry temptation that the adversary came his way with. And every temptation that came, an answer from the Bible was used to counter it. And notice what happened to Jesus. He stood fast. He stood his ground. And we can stand our ground. And after a while, the things that we normally succumb to, we are going to find that with using the scripture, and worse, we are now going into a period when we are going to embrace more and more the word. We are going to have a reservoir inside of us from which the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost, will be able to quicken and use it to become a rima word to speak to situations that you and I are going to come in. We are going to make that become alive in our lives, in our situations. And it's first begin. It first begin by flooding ourselves with this word from Almighty God. When this word come alive inside of us and we speak it into our situation, it transforms into that two-edged sword and it pierces the adversary. And notice when Jesus used the word and the adversary in Matthew 4 here, 
every temptation, there was a word in response. And you know what happened after a while? He stepped back for a season. No adversary can take stabbing and turning and pulling out the entrails and keep coming. Why Satan don't drop dead yet is because he's not a physical being that you can pull out his stripe and his heart stop beating. But he's going to have to step back. And if you want to see the adversary retreat in your life, if we want to see the adversary retreating in our lives, we have got to use this word in the two-edged sword format by reading it, studying it, meditating on it, applying in it, applying it, walking in it, and speaking it. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. It is written, it is written, I am more than conqueror. It is written, I am an overcomer. It is written, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. It is written. And if you're weak, the Bible said as you seek him and as you push after him and as you pursue him, you have to speak some things. Notice, let the weak say, I am strong. And I want to challenge some of God's people to say, I am not weak, but I am strong. And even if we are struggling, we need to get out of that struggle mode by getting into the word and then start to speak. Weak, let the weak say, I am strong. Say it. And start speaking, it is written, and living in the word. And watch and see how we are going to come over. How we are going to, victorious, to be victorious. How we are going to be on the winning side. And we are going to grow from strength to strength. I'm going to put together God's willing and when we meet again next week. And I'm going to have a list of scripture for all the maladies, the ailments, the, the, the issues that constantly flood the minds and the hearts of God's people and that is getting them down. And I'm going to show us practically, physically, how to use those very scriptures. Something for love, something for family, something for your work, something for every area that something can go wrong or where something can go wrong. There is a scripture. There is a scripture for it. And we're going to look at some of them and we're going to practice to use the scripture in our situations so that we become overcomers because that's really who we are and we are on the victory side so we close here this evening and god's willing i want to wrap up next week on this entire series of the word we'll do some review look at the thing that i told you we we're going to look at put all in perspective and we are going to wrap up on this series god's willing next week and put it together we can use the word. We can live in the word. We must walk in the word. And we must speak the word as a part of our walking in the word. And you will be surprised to see and know just from the principle of St. Matthew 4. That speaking the word straight from the book. Dissects and cuts and rips apart things in the realm of the spirit that you and I can't even see. We have just got to accept it. But at the end of the day, everything revolves around what we have on the inside. And what we have on the inside gets there by our reading, studying, and meditating on the words of Almighty God. God bless you. Now, we have a little program coming because very shortly, uh, uh, in, in the end of this month, towards the end of this month, 
we will make it the 20, the Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, which will be the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th of September. We go on three days of fasting as a church. Very important, brothers and sisters, every one of us, I am asking to be a part of this corporate fasting. It is for the benefit of the body of believers, the church of the living God, the corporate body. It is for the benefit of individual saints. We must be a part of these three days. We close off each evening by six. So we have made it in a way that nobody should be left out. We want all of us to be involved. And so those three days, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, the 28th, the 29th, and the 30th of September, mark it down, put it in our schedules. Let's prepare mentally for it. Take time off work if we can. Uh, take time off and give them all that is happening in the workplace and they're asking people to work from home. If you can get the time off, take it. And so we can give serious time to fasting over these three days. Then we want to have the Wednesday night. The Wednesday night, which will be the 30th of September. I'm going to be meeting in the sanctuary for prayer with those that are 25 and below. Yes, we, we have enough space for us to be social, socially distant and we are, will be in a position to maintain the protocol that are established and that Wednesday, 25 and below, that, and, and I assume as I speak if nothing changed because if, if things change based on the whole COVID situation, then we will make adjustments. So I'm just talking about what the plans are as at now. 25 and over, we will be in the sanctuary. 25 and below, sorry, we will be in the sanctuary for prayer. Those three evenings, uh, we are making arrangements because we want us to be together via Zoom in prayer meeting at least one hour. Uh, we will give you details on that in a little while, uh, what hour it will be, whether it is 6 to 7, you know, or 6.30 to 7.30 or 7 to 8, but at least one hour. We want us to just be together Wednesday evening for an hour, Thursday evening for an hour. And even as the young folks are together in prayer meeting on the Wednesday evening, we will still be on Zoom the Wednesday night for everybody else to be a part of prayer meeting one hour. Very important. Now, added to that, we are going to be going through the book of Psalm together in just Bible reading. We may take a little time to, you know, at some, at some points in between to give any little clarification to anyone. We, we will go as we are led where that particular part is concerned. But we want to go through the book of Psalm of the Psalms as a church. It means that we are going to work it out in a way, because we could say we are going to do a chapter a day. Some chapters are very short, some chapters are very long. So we're going to work out a program that will allow us to do, for example, chapter one and part of chapter two, or we're going to work out something. But what we're saying is that once we work it out for us, I would want every saint to follow through. We are doing this together because I want for those that don't normally read their Bibles to feel pressured to read with everybody else. That being the case, 
when we are through, at least a system will, would have been there that we can build upon to keep going on, that even when we are through, we continue to read. It's not going to stop others from reading the other parts of the Bible that they normally read. It's not going to stop others from doing their regular study. But we want to do about a chapter or the equivalent of a 20 verse chapter each day. There is one thing I'm going to ask, however. Let us say each day, just for argument's sake, we do two chapters. One of the chapters, the, one of the, what, for one chapter, you can read at any time at all. But for the other one, and I'm just speak, argumentatively speaking, for the other one, I want us to do it together. That means at a particular point in each day, for the next how many days it will take, to go through the book of Psalm, the Psalms, I want us to, at a point in the day, and we could probably do it for the evening, for the night, when we know everybody's at home, you're either at home or you're at work. Let us say, for example, 9.30. It means that once we begin this program, then at 9.30, here is what I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask that at 9.30, everybody, if the scripture to be read at that time is Psalm 29, then at 9.30, and that night, everybody, if you're at work, it might be the moment that you ask for a minute to go to the bathroom. If you are at school, which you shouldn't be, it might be the time that you ask for one break to go to the restroom, wherever. If you are at home and you normally would have gone to bed at 9.30, then we will ask that you differ that 9.30 time to say 9.40 or 9.45, whatever. But we would want at that particular moment, every saint from our church would have hear in Jamaica, overseas, wherever you are, those that have, are part of the Faith Apostolic Ministries family, you are included. Then if we say Psalm 29, wherever we are, at 9.30, we are going to stand and we are going to read Psalm 29. Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. And we are going to read it. So if we live in Papine, Portmore, Spanish Town, Linstead. If we live in Jamaica, United States, Canada, wherever, we are going to read at the same time. Now, there are countries overseas that has a time difference. So we are going to standardize the time. For example, if it's 9.30, we're going to adopt it is going to be 9.30 Jamaican time. It means that if you are in New York at this point, New York might be an hour ahead of us just now, it will be 10.30 in New York. If, those, if you are in Toronto, you're an hour ahead of us, it will be an hour ahead of us. If you are in Kelowna, you will be two hours behind us. That is it. But we are going to give the time as Jamaican time. Whatever time we eventually um, decide upon. And then wherever you are, just adjust yourself to that time. It means that in Nairobi, it will be morning for you when we are going to do it in the night. And if you so desire, I want to be a part of it. So that we read the thing together. There is this connection when we know that at this moment, thousands of persons are reading this together. And the Faith Apostolic Ministries family, we want as a family for us to be in the Word. All the things that we have been speaking about over the last couple of weeks are serious things. But they are not going to become effective and practicable 
if we don't first learn and practice to be diligent, to be um, faithful, to be consistent in reading and reading and reading. So we are going to develop this in all of us with this initiative. And we must have the word. We only begin with, we're only going to begin with the Psalms. But after a while, we're going to continue. And this is going to become a part of what we do so that everybody can get into the world because we're not leaving anybody behind. I hope we understand what we're doing. So Sunday, God's willing, we'll give you some more on this in terms of try to work out the time. We fix the time and, then we, and it's going to get underway at the time that we begin our fast, which is the 28th of September. Bear this in mind. God bless you richly. Let's do it in Jesus' name. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we bless your great name. We glorify you. We magnify you. We honor you. Thank you for what you're doing in our hearts uh, through your words. And I pray, mighty God, that you will help us to take seriously the reading and the studying and the meditating on of the words of Almighty God. Help us to do it. Help us to be diligent. Help us to be good stewards. Help us to be faithful. My God, in reading the words, in applying the word, and in walking in the word. All of us can make it in the rapture. And I pray that you will prepare us. But we know that we must live. We must abide in the word. Help us to do just that mighty God. Cover us, I pray, mighty God. Guide our going out and our coming in. I pray for those that are joining us from overseas. I pray for those that are unsaved and are taking it in but have not yet surrendered to you. Great God Almighty, reach down from heaven above. Minister to them, I pray, and have them to be a part of the family of the living God, living for you, walking with you. Have your way. Let your perfect will be done. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. God bless you richly. Thanks again for being a part of Bible study. And God's willing, next week, if our lives are spared and Jesus tarry, see you again and we close off on this series. God bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.